This video is brought to you by the Deck of Many and their Big Bad Booklet series. Hello and welcome back to the Gallant Goblin. Today we have the newest set of pre-painted miniatures from WizKids and the Pathfinder Battles line. This is City of Lost Omens, which is the second set supporting Pathfinder 2nd Edition. City of Lost Omens has 44 figures plus 6 pieces of dungeon dressing. We're opening up a case here, which includes 32 booster boxes. To learn all about the WizKids booster box system, visit GallantGoblin.com, where we have a comprehensive explainer. The link is in the video description down below. This set tops out at large figures, which are 2 inches by 2 inches. We're also doing a new giveaway. Win a booster box of City of Lost Omens by being a subscriber and leaving us a comment down below telling us how you would use one of the figures in this set. Tune in to our video on Monday, July 27th to see who won. There are also two premium sets accompanying City of Lost Omens. We have the Thieves Guild here and the Adult Red and Black Dragons. We'll take a look at each of these sets in a future video. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss those, and when they're out, you can see them by clicking the eye in the corner of your screen. The City of Lost Omens and Pathfinder lore is Absalom, the city at the center of the world. It is the epicenter of Galarian, which is the world of Pathfinder, and the location where many, many momentous events have occurred. This set includes figures from Bestiary 1, as well as figures from all three of the existing second edition adventure paths, namely Age of Ashes, Extinction Curse, and Agents of Edgewatch. There's another standalone adventure coming out later this year that takes place below Absalom called The Dead God's Hand. This set very likely contains creatures that you can use in that adventure as well. So let's open up these boxes and take a closer look. The city guards of the city of Absalom are responsible for de-escalating disputes before they get violent, protecting the citizens of Absalom from both common criminals and rampaging monsters, and maintaining the code of laws in the city. If you're interested in taking on the role of an Absalom Watch agent, you can play the Agents of Edgewatch Adventure Path for Pathfinder. You can learn more about it by reading the free player's guide in the link in the description below. This is one of several Absalom Watch sculptures included in the set. Here we see the common human watch cadet and the uncommon half-orc cadet. There are a number of repainted promo figures being developed with the set, including this version of the watch cadet with a darker skin tone. They haven't yet decided how they'll be distributing these variants, but when we find out, we'll let you know. You could use these figures as a generic guard, though they do sport the symbol of Absalom on their shields and capes. In July, the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Advanced Player's Guide will be released. Included in the book are what are called versatile heritages. A heritage is similar in concept to subraces in D&D. It represents the experiences of your ancestors and how their development affects you. The tiefling heritage will be included in that book, and if I'm understanding it correctly, you can have a tiefling heritage of any ancestry. This mini can be used as a player character with a tiefling heritage. There are two variants, a common version wielding a staff, and an uncommon version with an added spell effect in her hand. Gimmerlings are small, evil fey creatures who frequently live in urban slums where they try to blend in by shapeshifting into street urchins. They have a cruel nature and like to devise fiendish weapons and traps and then spring them on unsuspecting victims, often by luring them in by pretending to be in danger or need themselves. It's a level 12 creature with a stat block in Bestiary 1. This mini could also be used as a generic child, and like real children, it has one red glowing evil eye. The Leshy are forest deities in Slavic mythology. They are adapted into Pathfinder lore as intelligent plant creatures, generally created by druids. They were made a playable ancestry in the Lost Omens character guide. They often serve as emissaries of nature who try to encourage folks to build and act in an ecologically friendly way. We'll be talking more about the Leshy ancestry in a future video. The Leaf Leshy heritage means that your body is mostly made from foliage, rather than fungi or vines, for example. Leaf Leshies don't take falling damage. If you want to play as one in Pathfinder, just pick up the Lost Omens character guide. They also have a level 0 stat block in Bestiary 1. The Rat Folk, or Yasoki as they call themselves, are another new playable ancestry in Pathfinder 2nd Edition that will be introduced in the Advanced Player's Guide coming out this month. They're a core playable race in Starfinder. 
There are collectors, tinkerers, traders, and hoarders who often travel the world gathering a loot hoard that would make a dragon blush. They're generally quite communal and live in large warrens, often in subterranean areas and deserts and arid plains. I don't have the advanced player's guide to share their stats with you just yet, but they have a level 4 stat block in Bestiary 1. In D&D, we don't have rat folk in 5th edition, but you do have were-rats. In hybrid form, the were-rats keep their same size. So this could be a were version of a small creature like a halfling or a gnome. Another planar scion heritage being introduced in the Advanced Player's Guide is the Angelkin, also known as Asimar. A planar scion is the child or descendant of a pairing of a mortal from the material plane and an immortal creature from another plane. Tieflings are planar scions, as well as angelkin. Angelkin look very much human, but usually have some features signifying their heritage. For example, this warrior mini has a metallic sheen to her hair. They're also generally beautiful and strong-willed. The angelkin, or Asimar Redeemer, as the stat block has it, is in Bestiary 1 and is a level 5 creature. The Duragar are one type of creature that receives several sculpts in the City of Omens set. The Bombardier is one of two common figures that you can receive. The Duragar, unlike their other dwarven kin, stubbornly refused to venture to the surface world, and instead continued to toil in the Darklands. They embrace the exiled dwarven deity Droskar, and serve him in return for protection. They're slavers and raiders who frequently practice occult magics. The bombardiers dabble in alchemy and use slaves as the subjects of their experiments. They're level 1 creatures from Bestiary 1. Our second common Duragar is the Sharpshooter, a level 0 creature also from Bestiary 1. They serve as rain support for traveling slaver and raiding parties, and also work as snipers posted in towers overlooking Duragar encampments. They specialize in non-lethal range damage, as they're frequently tasked with putting down slave revolts, capturing escaping slaves, or seizing new slaves. Duragar operate in a strict hierarchical structure in which a taskmaster directs their subordinates in all aspects of their lives. We'll get to the Duragar taskmaster soon. The Tengu are another popular ancestry being introduced into Pathfinder 2nd Edition in the Advanced Player's Guide later this month. The Tengu are a mostly flightless, crow-like ancestry who are frequently persecuted by the common races. If you're coming over from D&D like I am, you may be wondering about the differences between the Tengu and the Kenku. Kenku are strictly a D&D creation, while Tengu are based on Japanese folklore and so are in the public domain. There isn't much in common between the Pathfinder Tengu and the D&D Kenku, besides their shared resemblance to crows. The Tengu do not have the famous Kenku language restrictions. In the islands known as the Shackles, Tengu are thought to ward off bad luck, so you'll often find one sailing on ships in the region. The Tengu Rogue is a level 2 creature in Bestiary 1. Here is yet another playable ancestry for Pathfinder. The Eruxi, or Lizard Folk, were made playable in the Lost Omens character guide. The Eruxi are one of the oldest ancestries on Galarian, with great empires that existed before the ascendance of humans. They're usually found in tropical or temperate areas near water. They are generally a patient people with a true neutral alignment who can be rather guarded when first encountered, but who will quickly warm up to newcomers and gladly engage in commerce and diplomacy with them once trust is established. The Lizard Folk Defender, as is listed in Bestiary 1, is a level 1 creature. The Low Aslanti, commonly referred to as Gilmen, are one of the last known direct descendants of the Aslanti people. The Aslanti were an ancient, near-mythical progenitor of humans on Galarian. The last pure-blooded Aslanti was the god Eridan, who we will talk about shortly. Most of the Aslanti were wiped out when a swarm of meteorites struck Galarian in an event known as Earthfall, but a few were saved by the Aslanti's original masters, the Algothus, or Abolis, who transformed them into the Gilmen who survived to this day. Note that there's a typo on the base of this mini, so it reads Lo Alanti instead of Lo Aslanti. So if you're searching for these on the aftermarket, you may want to use the misspelling. This mini could also be used for a female player character who wields a trident. There are three types of creatures who have multiple sculpts in this set. The Absalom City Watch, the Duragar, and the Zolgaths. 
there are two common Zolgath models and one rare. The Zolgaths are reptilian creatures who live in the uppermost section of the Darklands, which is similar to the Underdark in D&D lore. They're also commonly referred to as troglodytes. They're pretty evil creatures who often serve as goons for more powerful entities such as Nagas or demons. The Zolgaths play a large role in the Extinction Cursed Adventure Path. The Zolgath Skulker is a level 2 creature who stealthily patrols the tunnels of Zolgath Warrens. Our other common Zolgath, or troglodyte, is the Zolgath Warrior, bloodthirsty fighters who like taking prizes from their prey. The Warriors are level 1 creatures, and both can be found in Bestiary 1. I should also mention that they smell terrible. Just being near one can make you feel sickened. The warrior here attacks with his club and javelins. While the design is slightly different, you could also use these in D&D for troglodytes, which is great because there aren't many troglodyte minis out there at the moment. The cat folk are another playable ancestry being added in the Advanced Player's Guide. Also known as Amurans, the cat folk are gregarious and curious explorers who, like most good kitties, eventually get themselves into trouble, but who, also like good kitties, have quite a lot of good fortune to get themselves out of trouble as well. They claim to be from the far-off nation of Muraseth, a land rumored to hold a dark, closely held secret, though we don't know more than that at the moment. Cat folk commonly become rogues and rangers, and the pouncer stat block, which is at level 1, can be found in bestiary 1. Changelings are the children of hags and are destined to become hags themselves one day. The changeling heritage will be added in the advanced player's guide. They can be of most any ancestry, but are most commonly human. They manifest certain abilities like dark vision, claws, and some magical abilities depending on the type of hag who mothered them. They are eventually called home to their mother's coven. Changeling exiles are those who resist the call and who choose to live in isolation. A changeling exile plays an important role in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition demo adventure, Torment and Legacy, which is free to download at the link in the description of this video below. We played through it recently and had a great time. The changeling exile has a stat block in Bestiary 1 and is a level 3 creature. This mini makes a good player character mini for any kind of wilderness survivor. Another heritage being added in the Advanced Player's Guide is Dampier, which is the offspring of a vampire and a living parent. They have a natural connection to negative energy, which heals them, though they're also susceptible to damage from positive energy in the same way that undead are. They're often abandoned as children because their living parent sees them as cursed. They rely on their supernatural charisma and magnetism to get by as outcasts. The Dampier Wizard stat block is in Bestiary 1 as a level 2 creature. And now we come back to our next Duragar, the Taskmaster. These are usually priests of the Taskmaster god Droskar. They command not only the Duragar slaves, but their Duragar subordinates as well. You wouldn't necessarily know which was which by the way the Taskmaster treats each of them. They're not particularly popular around Duragar camps. Their level 2 stat block is in Bestiary 1. The Duragar have one other primary ability we haven't spoken about yet. A big one, but we'll come back to that in a little while. So we talked about tieflings and Asimar as planar scions, or people who are the result of a pairing of a mortal from the material plane and a being from another realm. Another of these is the Duskwalker, who are humanoids with a monitor bloodline, infused with the same energies as psychopomps. While demons are evil and Angel Ken or Asimar are good, the monitors are neutral outsiders who generally serve as caretakers of other realms. The psychopomps, for example, are monitors who serve the goddess Phrasma in her boneyard, or commonly referred to as purgatory. The Duskwalker Ghost Hunter here is a level 4 creature in Bestiary 1 and has ghost touch weapons, like the hatchet here, which are effective against incorporeal undead creatures. Here's our second lizard folk, or Eruxi mini. Again, the lizard folk were added as a playable ancestry in the Lost Omens character guide. 
The Eruxi are quite religious, some looking to Gozra, some to Desna, but many following Druidic traditions. They often look to the stars, not only for navigational purposes, but for prognostication. The stargazers are venerated in Eruxi society and come armed with a number of primal spells to aid their clans. The Lizardfolk Stargazer is a level 3 creature in Bestiary 1. The Knights of the Aeon Star were an order of armored magi who served the court of Aslant back in its heyday. After the fall of Aslant during Earthfall, which we talked about earlier, some of the few surviving knights came to serve the living god Eridan, while others have searched for secret lore and a new leader to restore the glory of Aslant. This knight wields a crystalline sword that's a replica of Eridan's. One note, it appears that the name of the order changed between 1st edition and 2nd edition. It used to be known as the Knights of the Ayun Star, that's I-O-U-N, but now it's the Knights of the Aeon Star, A-E-O-N. They appear to be the same thing, it's just a new spelling as far as I can tell. As I've mentioned before, Harpies are just the worst. In every game I've ever played, Harpies are the worst. In Pathfinder, they're feral, evil, human bird amalgamations who lure victims in with their captivating song and then murder and eat them. While they aren't generally found in Absalom, they do live on the Isle of Krotos where Absalom is located. This is one of the first male harpy minis I've seen. Another alternate paint job is being produced as a promo. This harpy will have tropical plumage, but will still probably be the worst. Here are our uncommon Absalom watch minis. These are officers as opposed to the common cadets we saw earlier. While they look similar and have a similar pose, there are subtle differences. Their pose is a little more assured. Their uniforms have more ornamentation. They have a more prominent Batman utility belt and they're wearing a longer coat. They also have a helmet instead of a cap. In Agents of Edgewatch, the PCs will mostly be dealing non-lethal damage, so having a baton is a good choice. The Chu'ulathi, or Chul, were introduced into the hobby back in 3rd edition of D&D. These large-sized armored crayfish lurk in fresh or saltwater environments around the world and lie in wait to snatch unsuspecting prey from the surface with their tentacles, which can cause paralysis. They're actually intelligent creatures capable of speaking, though generally they're only heard taunting their prey. Not much is known about Chul society if such a thing can be said to exist. The Chul is a level 7 creature in Bestiary 1. Now I mentioned earlier that Duragar have a defining ability, and that ability is to magically enlarge themselves. Duragar steep themselves in occult traditions, and thus have a number of occult spells at their disposal. The three Duragar stat blocks in Bestiary 1 are able to cast Enlarge and Invisibility on themselves. The Enlarge spell makes them into large creatures, increases their reach to 10 feet, and gives them a plus two status bonus to melee damage. But it does make them clumsy, which affects their dexterity-based checks like their armor class. Kruths are large-sized mega crocodiles who live in bogs and swamps. Besides enjoying feasting on humanoid flesh, except for goblinoids who they find gross, they have a number of interesting properties. The male Kruths in particular have unique enzymes in their organs which can be very valuable to alchemists. They also have hollow teeth that they can break off in the flesh of their victims to cause persistent bleed damage and to cause them to gain the drained condition. Kruths are level 8 creatures featured in Bestiary 1. Another creature that's found on the Isle of Kortos, where Absalom is located, is the Minotaur. First introduced to Kortos more than 4,000 years ago, when a Minotaur warlord from Kazmaron named Varadni Voon came to Kortos to ascend to godhood himself using the Star Stone, just as Norgorp later did. He was defeated by the guards of Absalom, led at the time by the god Eridan himself. Minotaurs are ferocious hunters who live in labyrinthine mazes or ruins. They're level 4 creatures in Bestiary 1. Dinosaurs have a pretty big presence in Pathfinder. They're considered remnants from the world's primeval era and are generally found either in isolated and remote wilderness areas or deep underground in the magical darklands. The Panakosaurus is a large creature and is of a type of armored dinosaur called Ankylosaurid. 
The Panakosaurus appears in the first book of the Extinction Curse Adventure Path, and that's where you'll find his level 4 stat block. The mini could also be used here for a young Ankylosaurus. The adult Ankylosaurus is a huge creature with a stat block in Bestiary 1. This is not the DC superhero of the same name or the ship upon which the Legends of Tomorrow cruise through the time stream, but it is a hippocampus riding Absalom light cavalry unit that protects the harbors of Absalom as well as the entire coast of the Isle of Cortos. A hippocampus is basically an amalgamation of a horse and a fish and is as trainable as a horse is, so they are highly prized as mounts, pets, and beasts of burden, particularly by undersea societies. The Hippocampus is a level 1 creature in Bestiary 2. I don't see a stat block for the Wave Rider just yet, but I imagine it might be in Agents of Edgewatch. While the Isle of Cortos has a number of societies outside of Absalom, like the Minotaurs, the Harpies, and the Centaurs, which I'll talk about next, there are also quite a few wandering, mindless beasts out there, particularly zombies that were created long ago from the soldiers that fell during old sieges of the city. The zombie brute here has a few necromantic augmentations to make it even larger and stronger than your average zombie. He's a level 2 creature found in Bestiary 1 who comes armed with his own arm. And here's our centaurs who, as I said, have their own society on Cortos. Centaurs are neutral creatures, so not as hostile as the minotaurs or the harpies. They're legendary hunters and trackers, reclusive and prideful. There have been skirmishes between the humanoids and the centaurs in times past, but as long as the humanoids respect the boundaries of centaur territory, the peace remains. But cross them at your peril. They have a level 3 stat block in Bestiary 1. They have weapon swapped variants here, one with a sword and shield and the other with a spear. The stat block contains information for both varieties. Chief Zuzgut is the head of a band of goblins called the Crooked Toes, who basically moved in and took over a rundown neighborhood in Absalom known as the Puddles. Chief Zuzgut is a rather celebrated figure, having helped the paladins and knights of Ozum in their retreat from Last Wall. The tribe itself is helping to rehabilitate the image of goblins. They now leash their young instead of caging them. They hunt and gather food instead of stealing it and they replace their love of fire with a veneration of the sun and the god Serenre. Chief Zuzgut is a patron of the arts and set up his headquarters in a rundown playhouse. He features in the year of the open road season of the Pathfinder Society organized play campaign, and I imagine he'll likely show up in Agents of Edgewatch. Our last Absalom watch figure is the Captain. He has a full long coat and a cape and a bigger helmet. His pose indicates to me that he's ordering his squad into some sort of action. His mouth is open and screaming orders. Now, as far as I can see, there's no stat block for these Absalom Watch characters just yet, but I expect we'll have them in the first Agents of Edgewatch Adventure Path book coming out later this month. If you get a case of the City of Lost Omens minis, you'll end up with a pretty good squad of city guards. We'll show you the whole grouping in a little bit here. In Pathfinder, sometimes the gods walk amongst the people, so the folks at Paizo and WizKids are good about giving us minis for them. This is Eridan, the founder of Absalom, the last Aslanti, the patron deity of humanity, the person who raised the star stone from the bottom of the ocean, and the person upon whom the calendar of Pathfinder is based. He is also 100% absolutely positively irrevocably dead. He has ceased to be. He's expired and gone to meet his maker. He's a stiff. Bereft of life, he rests in peace. If you hadn't nailed him to the perch, you'd be pushing up the daisies. He's kicked the bucket. He shuffled off his mortal coil, run down the curtain, and joined the bleeding choir invisible. This is an ex eridan Belize angels are usually formed from the souls of people who performed evil acts in life, but who successfully found redemption. They now serve as confessor angels, often for the goddess Serenre. They help guide mortals who find themselves facing moral dilemmas or crises of faith. They don't tell people what to do, but they help them put words to their feelings and reach decisions that are true to the person's heart. The Belize angel is a level 8 creature with a stat block in Bestiary 1. 
The naiads are types of nymphs who protect natural bodies of fresh water. The naiad queens rule the lands near those sources of fresh water. They're kind and welcoming to those whom tread lightly, usually taking on a more humanoid form like this when interacting with people. But if you threaten their territory or have ill intentions, they are armed with potent primal spells to quash any hostile interlopers. There are level 7 creatures and bestiary 1. Norgorber is our other god many in this set. Along with Iomede and Caden Kalian, he is one of the Ascended, a group of mortals who assumed godhood after passing the test of the Starstone. Though Norgorber's origins prior to Ascension are a mystery, he is the god of murder, poison, thievery, and secrets, and the only member of the Ascended with an evil alignment. The premium set accompanying this release is a Thieves Guild, which comes complete with a shrine to Norgorber. Check the eye in the corner of the screen to see our review of that set when it releases. Speaking of the Thieves Guild, we certainly need someone to run it, and this Thief Guildmaster figure is here to fill that slot. With the hood and the coat, this mini could represent a variety of ancestries any gender, and several different classes from rogue to bard to swashbuckler. The Thief Guildmaster is armed with a short sword and a short bow and has what appears to be a very small spell effect in one hand. The Zolgath Chief, or Leader as he's called in his level 3 stat block in Bestiary 1, is the last of our Zolgath Warband in the City of Lost Omens set. They're generally the strongest, most bloodthirsty members of the Zolgath clan, though the clan itself may be led by a more powerful demon cultist or other monster who's just using the Zolgaths as goons or slaves. The chiefs are armored with a great axe and javelins as seen on this mini, but they can also enfeeble foes with a well-placed bite. <sighs> okay, so let's get through this one quickly so we can get him off our screens because he's probably the creepiest mini I own. This creature is new to Pathfinder here in the second edition bestiary. You can find them deep in the Darklands, traveling and living in swarms, as if one of them wasn't creepy enough. They make little clacking sounds when they move as their many joints pop and crack as they skitter around, but they can suppress the sound if they want to approach prey quietly. I hate to mention it, but there are rumors of so-called Great Gogateths that are nearly 100 feet long. These guys here are powerful level 12 creatures, the most powerful in this set outside of the gods, and now we're going to stop talking about them. In Pathfinder lore, green chromatic dragons are contemplative, disciplined, and obsessive about their topics of interest. They're lawful evil by nature, but if you approach with great reverence and with information that they may covet, you can successfully treat with one diplomatically. They usually live in forests and have a breath attack that causes poison damage. A large-sized dragon like this would be considered a young green dragon with a level 8 stat block in Bestiary 1. Another creature making its debut in Bestiary 1 is the Ophalth, which is the cousin of the Shambler, which is a living amalgamation of soggy vegetation. The Ophalth is composed of wet detritus, sewage, and trash. I imagine it wins the medal for the worst-smelling monster in Pathfinder. They have a not-so-friendly rivalry with the Odiugs. The Ophalth is a level 10 creature, so more powerful than the young green dragon. One note— Ophoth is spelled with one F in Bestiary 1, but with two on the base of the mini, so if you're searching for it on the aftermarket, keep that in mind. You could also use this mini as a shambler or a shambling mound. Our capstone mini for this set is the Skin Stitch, which has a very appropriate name. As far as I can tell, the Skin Stitch hasn't made its second edition debut just yet, but does appear in Bestiary 4 for first edition Pathfinder. The Skin Stitch is basically an overstuffed scarecrow, made from cloth, leather, and skin, and then stuffed full of hay. They're usually created by spellcasters of middling power. Often, swarms of vermin and other creatures find their home inside the skin stitch. Bestiary 4 even provides information so that your first edition crafter can make one of their very own for the very reasonable price of 3,500 gold pieces. 
This set also marks the return of the Pathfinder Dungeon Dressing. You typically get two of these in a brick, and they will take the slot of a mini. So you'll get eight Dungeon Dressing minis in total if you get a case. We received two of the Dark Side Mirrors and two Armageddon Orbs. They each took the slot of a medium or small mini. The other four, the Mirror, the Statue, the Swinging Scythe Blade, and the Star Stone, took the place of a large mini in their respective booster boxes. Most of these are based on traps and objects in the Pathfinder Pathfinder 2nd Edition Core Rulebook. These minis do not have bases except for the Swinging Scythe Blade with its clear base, but let's take a closer look. You can find the Armageddon Orb on page 526 of the Core Rulebook. It's considered a level 23 simple hazard, meaning a trap that goes off only once unless it's reset. Now, level 23 might seem rather high, so what does this rather innocent looking red orb do? Well, it's forged from a drop of the god Ravagug's blood. It can be set to go off in a particular trigger, usually when its creator dies. When triggered, it causes fire to rain from the sky, dealing 10d6 damage to everything in a 100 mile radius, generally killing most everything in that area. Here we have a life-size statue of Eridan himself, which you can use to decorate your shrines, temples, or town squares in Absalom. You could also creatively use it to represent one of your minis if they happen to get petrified by a passing basilisk. It has a similar but distinct pose when compared to the Eridan mini in this set. The statue has his sword sheathed and his hand outstretched. The Dark Side Mirror is a level 14 complex hazard found on page 528 of the Core Rulebook. Complex hazards function mechanically like monsters. They're included in initiative order and have actions of their own, usually in a set routine. In this case, when a non-evil creature is reflected in the mirror, they are absorbed into it and replaced with an evil mirror duplicate, unless they succeed on a DC 34 reflex save. It takes a successful DC 34 thievery check to retrieve the original person from the mirror dimension once their doppelganger has been slain. It's also just a pretty mirror mini that you could use to decorate your bedroom battle maps. And here we have the legendary Starstone itself, discovered by Eridan at the bottom of the Inner Sea, seemingly lodged there after hitting Galarian as part of the Earthfall event that I told you about earlier. When Eridan touched the Starstone, it took him on a vision quest that challenged him physically, mentally, and morally, but he emerged from the trial as a living god. His first godly act was to raise the Star Stone and the land around it to form the Isle of Kortos, which is also known as Star Stone Isle, where he then founded the city of Absalom. In Starfinder, the Star Stone can be found at the core of Absalom Station. This figure is based on the art from the cover of the Lost Omens Gods and Magic book. Here we have our classic Swinging Scythe Blade Mechanical Trap. It's considered a level 4 hazard. There are two blades in the trap description, but just one on the mini itself. The blades are hidden in the ceiling until triggered by a tripwire being pulled. It'll hit anyone under its 15 foot long ceiling groove. And as you can see, the blade on the mini does swing back and forth and you can put minis on its large sized clear base. The Wheel of Misery is another complex hazard with a level of six. It's triggered when a creature comes within 100 feet of it. On its turn, it spins and stops on a particular rune as determined by a dice roll. It then casts the corresponding spell on the creature closest to it. The options are Sleep, Paralyze, Lightning Bolt, Blindness, Acid Arrow, or Ray of Enfeeblement. The wheel itself can be rotated by hand, but it isn't loose enough to actually spin. Still, it's one of the coolest terrain minis I've seen. This set includes three warbands, as I'm going to call them. First, we have our Absalom Watch Brigade. These are all the cadets, officers, and captains we pulled in our case. If you get a case as well, you'll likely have a slightly different assortment of minis, but you should have only one captain. This is a great crew to serve as guards in Absalom or in Waterdeep or whatever city or town your campaign may visit. Next, we have our Duragar Warband, useful for both Pathfinder and D&D. Duragar in both games are known for being able to enlarge themselves, so you'll be able to get use out of all of these figures. Finally, we have the Zolgaths, or Troglodytes. 
an especially useful warband if you're playing the Extinction Curse adventure path, but also good to have on hand for D&D as well, as there aren't a lot of troglodyte minis out there at the moment, though they do show up in quite a few D&D adventures like Out of the Abyss, Stranger Things, and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. This was originally planned to be the first set of WizKids minis to feature clear bases on at least the large creatures. But aside from the swinging scythe blade mini, that didn't end up occurring. Mythic Odysseys of Theros will instead begin that transition to clear bases. We're still in early days for Pathfinder 2nd Edition minis, and since there are only two sets a year, each set has to serve a number of purposes. City of Lost Omens fills out more common monsters from Bestiary 1, gives you some important minis for your Extinction Curse and Agents of Edgewatch adventure paths, and gives you some new player minis representing the new ancestries and heritages from the Lost Omens Player's Guide and the Advanced Player's Guide. Most of those PC minis, like the Angelkin Redeemer, the Dan Fear Wizard and the Lizardfolk Defender can also serve as NPCs, of course, with their stat blocks in Bestiary 1. I wish we had the first book of Agents of Edgewatch to really see what creatures and stat blocks were included with it, but we haven't been able to get our hands on it just yet. The quality of the minis and the paint jobs are very good again and continue to improve by my eyes. Nothing arrived broken, but we did have one naughty Kruth that came off as base. He was easy enough to reattach. We used the hot water trick to straighten out a few of the bent pieces, but otherwise it was fine. The packaging was pretty uniform with the exception of the centaurs, which came wrapped in two pieces of hard plastic instead of one, so they were very well protected. If you're a Pathfinder 2nd Edition player, you get two of these Pathfinder battle sets every year, and you can tell that the folks at Paizo and WizKids try to make every slot count. I'm sure every Pathfinder player is going to want an Eridan Mini and a Norgorber. The Absalom Watch agents are also a must, and the Chul and the Wave Rider just look amazing. For D&D only players, there's still a lot to choose from here. You may not be interested in the full set, but you can certainly use most of these minis in your D&D battles and your players won't ever know the difference. Instead of Eruxi, Zolgaths, Tengu, and Catfolk, you just call them Lizardfolk, Troglodytes, Kenku, and Tabaxi. The set dressing pieces are of course unique to the Pathfinder Battles line, and they made some excellent selections here. Instead of just like a shrub or a throne, you get items with either lots of important lore like the Starstone, or entire stat blocks like the Armageddon Orb and the Wheel of Misery. The interactive ones like the Wheel and the Scythe should give your players a nice treat as well. And don't forget to enter our giveaway to win a booster box of some of these Cities of Lost Omens minis. Just two things you have to do. Make sure you're a subscriber to our channel by clicking the little subscribe button, and then leave me a comment on this video telling me which of these minis is your favorite and how you might use it in your game. All in all, another excellent set of pre-painted minis from WizKids. It's an exciting time for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I've been spending my time in quarantine listening to the Glass Cannon podcast, which is an amazing live play series of the Pathfinder adventure known as Giant Slayer. And if you want to get a taste of what Pathfinder is like compared to D&D, I very much recommend checking them out as long as you're okay with a little off-color but well-meaning humor. We'll be doing our reviews of the premium figures for this set as well, the Adult Red Dragon, the Adult Red and Black Dragons, and the Thieves Guild set. We'll do those really soon. If they're out now, at the time you're watching this, you can see them by clicking the little eye in the corner of your screen. You can stay tuned to the end of this video to see what we got in each box in case you're curious. We want to thank our sponsor for this video, the Deck of Mini, and their Big Bad Booklet series. You can visit BigBadBooklet.com to subscribe to their Patreon. Depending on the tier that you choose, you can get a new set of tarot-sized reference cards for 5th edition every month, as well as a full-color booklet detailing a new boss monster or set of monsters that you can drop right into your ongoing D&D campaigns. Each booklet has art, stat blocks, lore information, role-playing guides, story hooks, and more. This month, come meet King Blurk, a sentient gelatinous cube with a taste for the finer things in life and an army of chef goons at his disposal. King Blurk, he'll make you an offer you can't refuse. Learn more and subscribe today at BigBadBooklet.com. Thanks for watching today. There's a lot happening here at the Gallant Goblin this month, so be sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the reviews that we have coming up of massive dragons and flumps and space goblins and hydras and more. If you enjoyed this video, you can help us out by clicking the little thumbs up button down below. I hope you're doing well, and I'll see you next time at the Gallant Goblin. Mm -hmm.